So I'm going to talk a little bit about trading process and keys to success for me. It's a big piece of what I do. And a lot of stuff on Instagram and social media, they push that trader lifestyle. First thing I got to tell you is if that's what you're going for, then just stop. Because uh, just a little secret, once you get there, you know, if you're going for the next watch, car, or home, you know, it, you're, you're already in the wrong mindset. So a uh, little secret is that, you know, once you do get there, you get a watch, it's not all it's cracked up to be. Car, same thing. So um, the second thing is uh, we've done a couple meetups recently, uh, saying Lucci is an option trader and myself, and we always ask people, what's your number? And everybody's always got a number. It's a hundred K, a million. 5 million, whatever, and then that's when they're happy. Um, but the problem here is that, you know, once you get to your number, 100K, guess what? That turns to 200K, and then it turns to 500K, a million, 2 million, 5 million, 10 million. And the problem here is it continually goes up exponentially. So your mindset, especially in trading, is everything. And the, the sooner that you change your, your headspace uh, to finding a proper life balance, the sooner that you're gonna be successful and it keeps your goals kind of aligned with the way that life is supposed to be. Otherwise, you're never gonna be happy. And uh, you know, there's a lot of people that do extremely well that I talk with every single day, but they're never happy because they're always going to that next goal. So um, the best traders that I know, rather than focusing on that, focus on process. And the outcome is validation of good process, not a means to material rewards. So I'm going to talk about kind of my own trading process and, and what I do. And the first part of that is kind of identifying what a good trade is. So for me, I call that an A plus setup and they don't happen often, right? So they might happen once a week, maybe max of two, but occasionally three to four times a month. The best traders that I know execute well three to four times a month. You know, it's about being in, the trenches, it's about seeing the market, being familiar with what's you know, working on any given day, any given month. However, three to four times a month is really what makes their year. It's a high probability trade, and normally you might look for something, maybe a, a two reward to one risk, three reward to one risk. But these are the five to 10 to ones with the ability to scale in. So what I mean by that is, you, know, you might normally trade 1,000 shares or 2,000 shares. But these types of setups, given the high probability of working out, because they're A+, plus, they don't happen that often, 80-90% of the time they work, gives you the ability to get maybe to five or 10,000 shares. So not only are you getting five to 10 to one reward to risk, but you're also able to size up more than you normally would. So de defining your setups. These can be different for everybody. So these are just mine. They may work for you, they may not. However, my goal here today is just maybe to, maybe you take one thing from it and you can better your own setup. So a good example here, um, and I don't know where Jim, Jim Telton, uh, most of you guys know him, I guess maybe JT, according to the Nigerians, that's what they call him. But, um, so he's in my room and he doesn't follow me. He's in the Nigerians room. He doesn't follow them. But what he does is he takes a little bit out of my room, takes a little bit out of theirs, and he's formulated his own strategy, what works for him in his own personality, and that's the way that it should be. So, uh, you know, how many of you guys usually take a trade first and then you ask questions later, right? What you need to do is you need to fit it into a category before you take a trade. So right away, as soon as you see something, rather than going in first and asking questions later, you should always, the first thing should be like, all right, this is this type of setup. It fits into this category. And if you can't do that, then you don't have a trade. So these are my favorite setups. The first two is what I consider A plus setups. These are where I want to risk the most because 80 to 90% of the time, and that's stats, reviewing your trades, understanding that kind of stuff. That's where you get those numbers from, um, which I highly suggest to do as well. But the first two are the ones where I will risk the most money. The others are what I would consider maybe like a daily driver, something that you come to the market every single day, you're gonna find proper risk, proper reward. The first one is an overextended chart. So many of you guys might uh, notice this one, it's Overstock. It's been a pretty fun trade the last couple weeks. They had a massive move and it was pretty much going straight up off of the 15 level all the way up to almost 30. So it almost doubled within a week. And what interests me about it is it goes up a dollar, a dollar, a dollar, two dollars, two dollars, and then it starts to speed up. 
And so what I want is an overextended chart without any correction because it's normal for stocks to ramp up, consolidate, come back a little bit, ramp up, consolidate, and continue on. When they don't, they typically have sharp corrections. And that's what I want to be able to take advantage of. So my particular trade on this, it was a morning that it was going up, like I said, a dollar, dollar, two dollars, two dollars. And within the first 40 minutes of the day, it had already been up two dollars per share and it started to scale or it started to speed up. So for me, I like to dabble. I like to get in there a little bit just to kind of test my thesis. And then as it started to reject and come back in, that's when I wanted to scale in. These are the ones that I want to be most aggressive and most patient on because you've been monitoring it for weeks. You're waiting for that big pullback. It's finally come. And so you don't want to turn that one week, two weeks of patience waiting for the top into a two minute trade, right? You want to let it work. You want to let the trades work for you. You don't want to work for your trades. The next is a high percentage gap up with volume plus news plus delusion. So this is in small cap world. Um, a lot of people, this is a very popular thing right now, especially the last probably three to six months. There's a lot of algorithm driven trades, things like that. These are big gap ups that have a lot of volume, but the delusion piece is the most important. And I prefer to sell when they can sell. Right? So if a company can sell into the market, I want to be selling with them. I don't want to be buying what they're selling. My suggestion to all the guys in the room is to always reverse engineer the trades that I put up here. So if you take the time and go look at this particular trade, which is on MRNS, and then the next one, which is on AIM, compare the two filings and see what the similarities are. And you're going to get your answer as to why I'm interested in these particular setups. Typically what I do is I look for it to gap up. I want to let it put in the top. I want to let it kind of exhaust traders. Everybody likes to chase. Everybody's fear of missing out. Everybody's afraid to, to miss that move. So I want it to ramp up, pull back and start to confirm lower highs. And at which point I'm interested in fading it. I prefer to short sell, by the way, if you haven't noticed, I do have long setups too. The other thing too, to consider is VWAP, which I'll get into after, but VWAP is a fantastic tool. And typically what I do is I look left on the chart to kind of anticipate where I'd like to scale into a position. So, and I'm going to go on that over that on a couple other charts, but again, that's a very important thing. I always look left to predict right. Another example on AIM, this is a, shows it a little bit better where you can see, you know, there's resistance right over here from pre-market comes back up, shoots up, ends up coming back in. And you can also see that it fails at the VWAP once again. So these are, so those are the A plus. Those are the ones where I'm very, very confident. I'll use a lot more size than I typically would on, on the next three setups. And I have a lot more patience as well. So you can see, I let that work all day until I think there's an arrow somewhere around here. Very, very patient. Let the trade do the work rather than always in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out. So I see a lot of people, you know, as soon as you get into a trade, you're always looking for the exit, but I would, try to work on letting the trade work for you. You get a lot more success out of it. You know, I used to be that scalper in and out, in and out, in and out, but you start to realize that a lot of the, the bigger, better type traders are focused on a much bigger time frame. So ABCD breakouts. This is basically a setup that I want to see in order to get long. And from talking to Pete last night, and he had said he'd done a lot of one-on-ones with you guys, one of the common things was discipline. The key with this is you know where to be disciplined. You know where you're wrong. And so I'm not trying to predict where it's going to go with A. I'm not trying to predict where it's going to bottom. But what I want to do is I want to start to see it have higher lows. And at which point I would start in with a risk off of that green line. The key is you want it to ramp up. You want it to pull back, let it put in the base. And as they start to compete for the dips, so you'll see it come, come up a little bit, come back, up a little bit higher, come back, up a little bit higher. They're starting to compete for that best bid. And that's where I want to be involved, at least with a starter, maybe a fourth, a third, whatever it may be. And then I can scale in anticipating that breakout. Two things to consider. One is a lot of people buy that breakout. So you're going to get a lot of information real fast from whatever the tape says. That could be it ramps up, 
huge seller there, slams right back down. Or it could be breakout. So I always like to trim some into that anticipated breakout because you can always add back. I'd rather sell some, let it prove that my thesis is correct, and then scale into the trade. I have no problem rebuying the same price or a little bit higher. Um, and you know, now it's a little bit different because there's no commissions as of last week or whatnot for a lot of brokers. But you know, I always found it funny that people were too cheap to pay five bucks to get out of a position but then they'll go and lose 500 because they overstayed on the, on the trade anyway. So, so this is kind of like what it, what it would look like intraday where you've got a, a top, you've got a nice little ramp. And then at this level, it starts to have a little bit of competition on the bid side, starts to scale up. And I'd want to anticipate this breakout. If it breaks out and holds well, I want to continue to scale into the position. This was EROS, so I think about two weeks ago. You can see it's a little bit small, but you can see I started in on the, anticipating that break, scaled, scaled, scaled. And as it got away from VWAP, as it got through that breakout level, I was locking in. So I had about a third left and there's a little red arrow over here. And that was the last third that I had sold and I moved on from the trade. Let it base, let it consolidate. I'm looking to anticipate that breakout. At times I'll sell some depending on what the, the trade entails. Other times I'll scale into the winner like this one. So this is another example of CAG, C-A-G. I did not take this trade, but I felt like it was a recent example of a you know, similar setup where they're starting to compete for the bid side, anticipate the breakout over the prior highs and a nice breakout. So again, the key here is that if you're wrong, you have a place to be wrong. If you're right, the idea is that it might be a two, three or five to one multiple versus your risk. In the EROS example, I was literally risking five cents off the lows and it ramped up about 60 or 70 cents per share. Last setup or second to last setup uh, of the daily drivers. These are the ones that kind of keep you in the market, keep you familiar with what's going on, keep you, you know, kind of ready for when the A plus trade hits. This is a failed fall through momentum. Again, kind of looking left, you have some pre-market action where it's a little bit stuff, stuffy, where it's going into 10, 20, fails, 10, 20, fails, 10, 20, fails. So what I want is when it starts to come into the open, I hope anyway, that it ramps up into that level and gives me an entry. So that's a perfect example of that where it ramps up. I prefer to wait until the open. Anytime that it shows that there's resistance, my goal is pre-market, please ramp into the open because I have something that I can risk on. And at which point you can scale into it and look for the unwind. And I have here, you know, wait for a seller. So the best way to kind of see that is when it should have rebounded and it fails. Set up, ready to go, and it fails. Set up, ready to go, and it fails. The more times that happens, the more people are going to be on the wrong side of the trade, right? The better it looks, but ultimately fails. All those people that just came in to the right side, the offer, are going to go to the left side, the bid, as soon as they realize that, oh, this isn't breaking out, I better get out. And then you get that nice washout. Trend joins is a, typically I look for stocks to join and I scan for 6% movers. And the reason I do 6%, a lot of people might do seven, 8%, whatever, but I don't want to get involved in the two, three, 4% type movers. Typically those will stay around two, three, 4% on the day. I find that over 5%, so six, seven, eight percent a high percentage of them end up turning into 10, 15, 20% type movers. So that's where I want to be involved. I set up my scanner, 6% up, down, put in the, the volume parameters that you want. I prefer liquid names. I don't wanna be trading something with a couple hundred thousand shares. I wanna trade something with millions. I don't wanna have any influence whatsoever with any of the size that I trade. I wanna be a, a small fry within a big name. So. Perfect example of that where, you know, it just it hit my scanner, it's fading, tried to rebound, failed, tried to rebound, failed. And each time that it kind of tried to rebound and it failed, I add it. The further that it gets away from the VWAP, it's a good reminder. The other reason I like VWAP, it's a good reminder that maybe you should cover a little bit because you can always re-add if it starts to come back in towards the VWAP, which you'll see in a future slide. A couple keys for what I look for, price action and volume high relative volume, and, and obviously some big price action. What I want on a daily chart 
is above or below particular resistance levels. And then VWAP I'll get into as far as you know how to use it and how it can benefit you. On a daily chart, I want something that's not stuck in range because otherwise a lot of times you'll see a nice perfect setup and then it just kind of exhausts you into the move, comes right back down. I find that when it's outside of daily chart, either support in this case or resistance in Nike's case on earnings, it gives you that edge and that opportunity to go ahead and you know, let the trade work because it's got outlier range. It's broken down out of the chart. Consolidation area, you can see that there's you know, the blue line, you can see that there's a top, a top, a top, and then finally as it breaks through, you have a lot different style range. You've got that two to three dollar type move versus the days where it just kind of ramps up 50 cents, comes back 50 cents, and you're stuck in a consolidation. Every time you think it's about to break out, it goes the other way. When you think it's about to break down, it goes the other way. So this gives me a little bit more edge of letting the trade work uh, when there's a lot more volume, a lot more range. So if you take nothing else from uh, today, one of the, the main things that I suggest or would say is, you know, always look left to predict right. It's not 100%, but it's a good starting point. So the MRNS trade that I took, which was on the high percentage gap up, news and heavy volume, I took that trade and I was confident in shorting into that pre-market level because I looked left on the daily chart and it went right into the 230 level, which it's had trouble with, with volume, the last few times that it's tested. So not only does it give you a good starting point, and again, it doesn't mean it's gonna stop there, it's a good starting point, but it also helps you to avoid being too early because that stock was up maybe 30% at 180, 190. But instead of shorting, I wanted to see it at least test through the twos to the 220, 230s to see if it was gonna run into a seller. And it did, and in which, place, uh, in which case I put confidence in that short, along with the fact that the company could sell and let the trade work. Also keeps your emotions in check. There's nothing worse than you know, starting into a trade and covering, because you don't know how high it can go. But this is gonna allow you to kind of get on the other side of that and keep your emotions out of the trade. Like I said, I'll go back to VWAP. So this is a, a great example of, again, looking left, you've got some resistance, but again, it comes back and fails into the VWAP fails into the VWAP and then starts to fade off. In addition, like I had said before, sometimes the further it gets away, it's a good reminder that you might want to size down on the position because look, stocks trend, right? So if it, ramp, if it comes down a lot, there's a good chance that it might want to rally a little bit and then start to fade off again. So not only does this give another spot to re-add, but it is a good example of you know, keeping the emotions out because normally if you had overstayed, maybe you sized in a little bit, you might actually be emotionally involved now. If you have too much and you didn't cover into the washout, now you're a little nervous. So it's a good reminder to go ahead and cover, and at the same time, it might be a good spot to add. And I'd rather be adding there than covering there, but obviously, as you guys know, we don't always do the right thing, and I've covered this, this place many times. But the good part to remember is you can always get right back in. Better to be safe than sorry. So that's the technical side of what I do, the process, and the, the main types of setups that I look for. Um, and now we'll shift over to the psychological side, which you know not a lot of people spend a lot of time on. Um, and it's very, very important. So uh, one of the main uh, things is, you know, I'm sure some of you guys might have some real estate or condos or, or something like that. If your tenant is not paying you rent, what do you do? You kick them out. So it's the same thing in trading, right? So if you're staring at a stock that you're in all day and it's not paying you out, kick it out, find a new tenant. This is something that I always kind of remind myself because I have a knack of getting in something at 9.30 a.m. And you know, it does, it does its little move and then it starts to flatline and I'm still in it, 3.59, 59 and I sell right before close. So this is a good reminder that, hey, you know, you've, just like the, the horses in New York City, they all have their blinders on, they can't see right or left. If you get too involved, you're gonna miss that potential A plus setup that only comes three or four times a month. You're gonna miss these other layup type trades because you've got your blinders on because you're wasting precious headspace. You only have so much. So patience, there's three points here in patience. One is on entry, one is trade, and one is career. And they all kind of help one another. The most important 
thing is your entry, right? How many times you get into a trade, you, you have FOMO, you get into a trade, and all of a sudden you're emotionally involved. And then it's very hard to be patient because you know, right away you might be red, it might start going the other way, but had you been patient, you could have got a better entry. Patience in the trade. So we talked about you know, kind of letting the trade work for you rather than you working for it. The better the entry you have, the less emotionally involved you're gonna have, the more patience you're gonna have in the trade. So think bigger picture versus the little micro scalps. And that's gonna lead into the next point, which is patience into your career. You know, we all want money right away, but this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. You know, you're gonna have setbacks. I did a, a Benzinga conference in New York City, and I was talking about, I think it was last November, I lost 200 grand on PTI, and it was a bit, one of my biggest losses. So how do you come back that next day? Obviously, you're like, oh, well, I just got to try to make it back. You immediately go into make back mode. Now, that might be an outlier trade. It could be five grand, it could be 500, it could be 10, whatever it may be. It was a big loss. You always have to remember that time takes care of everything. So rather than go into make back mode, how am I going to make this back? What do I do? Start thinking three months, six months, 12 months out. That's going to get you in the proper mindset to focus on making that loss back. You're going to be able to check the boxes in the order that they should be. And before you know it, you're actually going to be back. You're going to, you're going to check those boxes faster than uh, you think possible because you're in the right mindset. There's nothing worse than being in the wrong mindset, chasing those losses, and then turning it into another loss and another loss and another loss, which is what most people do. Next is consistency. So consistency is uh, big, life, day, and trading. And this is probably the biggest thing that I've changed over the last year. Not so much life. Life's always been consistent. I have a good, great wife, and that's perfect. A lot of people might have a not so perfect relationship. You might have a lot of baggage coming into open that you gotta worry about. You might get a call at 929, still continuing on a fight from the night before, and instead of you thinking about the market, you start hammering the, hammering the, the buy, 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 sell, 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 whatever it may be. Now you're emotionally involved in, in stocks and taking it out on the market, you lose, nobody wins. So always kind of remember you know, where you're at and, and, and realize what factors might be causing you either stress and gets into the next point into your day. You know, like Friday, you know, I'm in Vegas. I've got my laptop, my screens. I shouldn't be trading super aggressively. Went to the Super Bowl, one of the best uh, traders that I know, super young kid. And here I am, I'm an addict, by the way, for trading. But here I am, I'm like, all right, I gotta set my alarm. I gotta get up for the open tomorrow. We're going to bed like two, 3 a.m. Meanwhile, he's like, I'm not in the right mindset. I'm not trading. Understanding that when things aren't consistent is very, very important. So uh, another uh, point here is, so Traders for a Cause last year, John Nigerian was always the first guy to the, the conference in the morning. Not only was he the first guy, but he had already gone to the gym. This is at like 6 a.m., maybe a little bit earlier, whatever it may be. But the more consistency you have in your life, the more it's gonna trickle down into trading. So. You know, putting in the gym, very important. Going to bed, nothing good happens at 10, after 10 p.m. So there's no reason to stay up, right? Go to bed. So if you get up, you can start your day that much earlier. You know, every day, like for me, I get up uh, Tuesday, Thursdays at 5, 10 a.m. And I have a trainer and I work out with him. And on the other days, I wake up at 6. I get way ahead. I get a lot of stuff done. And then I have my nights clear a little bit. But it's every single morning. I do pretty much the same thing. And that's all gonna trickle down into trading because if you've got all these different things pressuring you and pushing you different directions, it will cause your trading to get all over the place. You want to stay firing on all cylinders. There's nothing worse than you know, having a trading loss and not having that confidence when the A-plus setup comes. So it's difficult to do, but you always gotta try to do the right thing and avoid those massive drawdowns, those massive losses that are gonna cause you to lose that confidence that you need in trading. A lot of the setups that I, that I put out there involve confidence. You need to be okay stepping into that move. And if you're not, then you're gonna, you know, you're, you're, instead of maybe making 70 cents, you're only gonna have about 20 cents of opportunity. So trading does involve confidence, but obviously not too much. When I'm trading my best, I am consistently 
locking into the big moves. When I'm trading my worst, I am being patient on these big moves. I might nail the move and I'm like, all right, well, I'm on the right side. I might as well let it keep on going. And I'm ignoring the fact that it's really ripping and I end up selling it all the way back down. So you always want to try to perform at your best, stay at that elevated level because is, the more consistent you are and the more elevated level you are when you're firing all cylinders, it gains add up faster than you can imagine. If you need any help with you know, getting motivated and, and having that, David Goggins' book, uh, Can't Hurt Me, it was awesome. And uh, that was a really, really good one. If you, if you make excuses for you know, not getting up early, not going to the gym, not being consistent in your life, read that and uh, you probably will run out of excuses. I stole this from a good buddy of mine, Vic, at Traders for a Cause last year. We both were on a panel together, and he had a great way of explaining this. You know, as you're, as you're in a trade, you want to continually reevaluate your risk. And you, know, you got to think about it as like a dial, right? So are you outsized? Is it pr like still proving your thesis? Should it have broken out and it didn't? Should it have broken down and it didn't? Should you be adding? Is the risk to reward still in check? And you can continually change these dials. Do I have too much? Yeah, maybe I should tone it down a little bit. Is the risk still elevated? And if at any point those dials need to be changed, you should be shifting your trade. You should be changing the trade, maybe getting out of it. Maybe it's working perfect and you don't have enough risk on. Maybe it's time to scale up. Always go back to those dials and recheck. And that should be something that you do throughout the day. Every maybe 10, 20 minutes, whatever it may be. Um, so that they don't get away from you. Red flags, shortcomings, and traps. So a lot of people always say to focus on the losers, right? You can learn so much from your losers, but what happens if it's your winners that are gonna get, gonna get you, right? So if you're always shorting, you guys know what uh, circuit halts are? You know, when a, a low float stock starts to ramp, and if it moves 10% uh, over a five minute rolling period, it goes into a circuit halt, right? On these low floaters, you might nail the trade nine out of 10 times, even 99 out of 100 times. But more of my friends have blown up by doing this, shorting those low floaters. And it's the continual reward for doing a reckless trade and eventually it catches up. So a lot of times we always look at those losers, but sometimes our winners could be reckless. We might be being rewarded for making reckless decisions. So it's very important to review your trades, review the risks that you took to get there and you know, one example is one of my friends uh, was, I, I have a trading office with a, a couple of my friends that we all trade for ourselves. And uh, I had one a friend visiting and he was down a couple hundred bucks on the day. He's kind of learning and whatnot. So Roku was starting to fade and he was just like, you know what, I'm just gonna short it, see what happens. All right, covered. And he went from down a couple hundred to maybe down 1700 bucks on the day or something. I mean, seven, $17 on the day, almost flat. So that was easy. He just chased that, it worked out great. So now he got this false sense of confidence from a reckless trade. He just chased it, it worked out, 50-50 chance. So then he went and did it again. This time more confident because he just nailed it. And instead of being down $17, he ended up down the day $1,700. You know, you, this happens all the time, right? Where you, you make a trade and you think because you made a profit on it, it was a good decision. But it's not always the case. I'll leave with this. Uh, the idea is to become a better trader than the day before. And like I explained before with Jim, you know, the idea is to take a little from everybody, right? Just because your buddy does it does not mean it's going to work for you. You know, it's, it might not fit your personality. You might not have the screen time. Screen time's a must. And that's just simply watching tape, watching the moves, reviewing stuff all day, every day. And that comes with time. People look at the end result. And uh, an example uh, that, uh, that I'll use, Greg, who's involved in our, our charity as well. You know, he, used to, he posted like, his, his trades for a, a full year. And phenomenal trader, one of the best I know. And uh, so his gain was, I don't know, maybe 460000 on a particular trade. But everybody's eyes go to that. That's all they care about. Oh, you know, I could, man, that would be nice if I just make four hundred sixty k in a trade but they don't even give a shit about the $164,000 loss that he took to get there. And that's the problem with a lot of people. So, you know, everybody's story is different. You don't know what it took for, to get from point A to point B. Everybody's style does not work with every single personality that's out there. So mold your own, be inspired and not influenced 
And just remember that, you know, as far as consistency and everything like that, day one is better than one day. So start today. Thank you.